Good day, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us and especially our presenters from the city of Miami Beach. When we first came out with the TrueView 410, it was a brand new technology that integrated LiDAR with cameras. We were pretty excited about it. And along came Nestor from the city of Miami Beach with this very ambitious project. And I was thinking to myself, oh, you know, couldn't our first customer just be doing 20 acres of topo? Uh, instead, Nestor had this plan to do, I think, around 60 linear miles of seawall. Uh, so quite an ambitious project. And um, it, it's, I'm just pretty amazed at the, at the uh, way all of this came together for the city of Miami Beach. You know, our, our part of it was just to supply hardware and software technology, but the, you know, the vision and the execution and all that was the city of Miami Beach. So we're really pleased that they're able to share that with uh, this group this morning. Turn it over to you, Nestor. Oh, thank you, Lewis. Uh, much appreciated. And thank you, Crystal, as well. And uh, for everyone uh, joining us this morning to uh, let us share our experiences uh, with using uh, UAS technology to uh, map the, the seawalls within the city limits of Miami Beach. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, get started. So this process, we started back in 2019. Um, and uh, I'm going to just kind of touch on these different uh, categories, uh, with number one being the background, uh, number two, the logistics, number three, the data collection, number four, the prioritization, number five, the mapping, number six, the GIS demo, which will show the uh, interactive GIS, the number seven, discuss ongoing projects, and at the end, we'll uh, take some questions and answers. So a little bit of background. Um, the city of Miami Beach has always been investing in aging infrastructure uh, to reduce flood risks and also adapting to climate change. And we've been committed to building resilience on several front fronts. So over the last few years, the city has updated its land use code development regulations for new construction in order to address the stormwater retention setbacks and increase base flood and freeboard elevation. So recently we adopted an ordinance entitled Resiliency Standards for Tidal and Flood Protection, which basically requires all new seawalls and the reconstruction of existing seawalls that are in this, in this repair or causing flooding on adjacent properties and public right-of-ways to be constructed to a minimum elevation of 5.7 feet in AVD. And all, all the elevations I'll uh, refer to moving forward will be in, in AVD. So the city has approximately 55 miles of uh, seawalls and out of those 50 miles, out of those 55 miles, 50 miles are privately owned, where five miles are city owned. So the date, the city of Miami Beach has already reconstructed approximately one mile of seawalls. Uh, 0.2 miles of seawalls are currently in the design phase and one mile of seawalls are either under construction or under procurement to be constructed. So that left about 2.8 miles of city owned seawalls that require reconstruction. And this whole process that we went through um, is going to, uh, is revolving around those 2.8 miles of city owned seawalls that require reconstruction. But also, we needed to collect all the data for all the seawalls in the city to be able to do an accurate assessment of uh, um, what we needed to do to move forward. So under the direction of the City Commission, Public Works, and the Sustainability and Resiliency Committee, um, we were committed to conducting research to bring back a bunch of options for assisting the, uh, assessing the seawall elevations within the city. So Brian and I got together and we looked at all the options that uh, were currently available and we came up with four options where at the end we chose uh, an aerial system, a UAS with, uh, with LIDAR, to perform the data collection in-house. And uh, this selection allows us to reduce their costs, achieve the best quality, and avoid needing to access private properties, which is a big concern here uh, in Miami Beach. Uh, so together with the survey division, we did a topographical survey of all the city-wide uh, uh, city walls and to come up with a reliable mean elevation for each seawall. And that was gonna be the main parameter that we use to perform this evaluation. 
we also incorporated the uh, property appraiser's data for all the parcel information uh, to verify the lengths of the seawalls and to also uh, identify which are the private and city-owned seawalls as well. Then we took all that information and together with engineering, we developed a methodology to rank and prioritize uh, the reconstruction of the remaining 2.8 miles of, of uh, seawalls to do it all within the next 10 years. But it wasn't just simply figuring out what the elevations of the seawalls were and just saying, okay, we're going to take the lowest. We had to figure out the elevations, the locations of those seawalls, the condition of the existing seawalls. All those factors had to weigh in to rank the seawalls that needed to be uh, re either reconstructed or, or built. And then further adjust adjustments to the initial rankings uh, were made to account for the overall benefit due to contiguous private seawalls and the ability to promote and encourage neighbors to reconstruct their seawalls and join the city in this resilient efforts to create a continuous barrier throughout the city. So basically in a nutshell, rather than just looking at our own seawalls, we looked at all the adjacent seawalls um, to ours just to take into account the condition of those seawalls as well and the elevations and come up with uh, uh, a plan that takes all those other private seawalls into account as well. So back to the options. Again, we came up with four options. And the first one was a consultant uh, performing layer, uh, aerial LIDAR. And you can see here on the, the slide, the pros, we have a lot of a lot of pros, the high density point cloud, we can obtain the data on the top of the seawalls, accuracy is good, weather and tree canopies are not an issue. We can export uh, DEMs, the DTMs, uh, compatible with GIS and CAD, and not a, a whole lot of uh, staff time needed for the project. Now, the cons were that we need to place targets on private property, and that's an issue here in Miami Beach. We just don't have a lot of access to private properties, and there's a lot of private property compared to city-owned properties on, within the city limits. Uh, so personnel will need to access docks and seawalls to set the targets. And then in the end, the hardware and the software is, not, is owned by the consultant, not, not the city. So that was a factor. The second option we looked at was using a boat LIDAR. Basically the same pros as the aerial LIDAR, but the boat LIDAR had a lot more cons, basically because we're getting more of a profile of the elevation line of the seawalls um just the very top of the seawall but not very much into the property um the terrain model is only extracted on the seawall so again we can't see data back into the back of the property uh the docks and boats can obstruct the data return targets still need to be placed on private property uh, deliverables just didn't meet our engineering needs and again the hardware and software is owned by the consultant and we looked at the third option which was at the time we had an existing Matrice 200 with the Loki GNNS, uh, GNSS positioning system on it uh, that we had been using for photogrammetry. And we said, well, we could use that. But again, we had some cons where you can only fly during clear weather, which is not that big a, a deal. Obviously, we can just wait till we have clear weather. But we have the issue with the tree canopies. And a lot of these seawalls within the city are just have a lot of, a lot of vegetation coverage. Um, that was probably the biggest obstacle we ran into. Um, you need multiple flight passes, and the post-processing time is, is long uh, from the photo, using the photogrammetry method. And then the fourth option we looked at was uh, obtaining our own UAS with a LiDAR sensor to perform the analysis, and the pros just out, outweighed the cons. We could Everything we were looking for could be delivered using that uh, system. So that's in the end, that's the recommendation we made back to the committees, and they agreed, and we purchased a LiDAR sensor and drone and moved forward with the project. So a little more background. We initially, the city started with, uh, we started with a Phantom 4 Pro, uh, but we attached a Loki GNSS positioning system on it for higher accuracy. And initially, we were doing things like construction monitoring, um, taking videos of all our construction projects uh, before, during, and after. 
Uh, obviously, we do a damage assessment as well before doing an after storms, so we could uh, catalog damages, turn over to FEMA and so forth. We are assisted in search and rescue. We still do every year with uh, with the fire department. Uh, we train as well. And um, with the positioning system, we started looking at doing some photogrammetry um, with the survey department and using the the uh, Phantom Four. Well, since that started to pay off, and we saw the um, the benefits of doing using photogrammetry with the UAS, we moved up into the Loki, the uh, I'm sorry, the GJI Matrice 200 with the Loki, which is a lot more stable platform that allowed us uh, longer flight times, cover more area, and we started doing a lot of photogrammetry. I mean, uh, exporting out digital terrain models, contours, 3D models, doing change detection, a lot of um, before and after the storms on, on the beaches and to look at the volumes of sand that was washed away or lost, et cetera, that kind of stuff. And then that brought us to the current project, which is the seawall project and the LIDAR UAS that was needed to, to uh, move forward. And at the time, we were researching all these different sensors that were out there, and definitely a, there was quite a few to choose from. But one of the um, options was no one really had an option with a built-in photo sensors. You had to take existing photo systems and, and mount them, and um, it was it was complicated. And you had to you know the, the processing to sync up the photos and so forth and just at that time, um, Lewis's group had just come out with the TrueView 410 imaging system, which had not only the, the sensor, of course, but it also has dual 20 megapixel cameras built in um, so that as you're flying and taking, collecting the LiDAR data, it's also taking the, uh, the images, the photos, and all that is being synced up at the same time. And as well as allows you to take those uh, images and and colorize the point clouds which i'll show here in a few minutes so you basically had everything in one unit and they had they had just come out with the unit and we said you know this looks like the, the way to go and we said let's let's try it and let's do some testing and we did some testing and it worked out and we said let's move forward with this unit so moving into the logistics it was, took a lot of collaboration for all of this to come together. This, besides the GIS department and, and, and engineering, public works in general, we had to collaborate with the survey division, Brian's group, to, in order to meet the regulations for aerial mapping and surveying. Uh, of course, for the uh, accuracy guidelines, the, the GPS ground control points needed to be uh, set before each flight, uh, verifying the benchmarks and the accuracy of each flight. And then as well as we had to coordinate with the fire department, which already had an existing certificate uh, of authorization issued by the FAA, so we could fly under that uh, COA. And of course, we also had to uh, abide by the FAA flight rules with uh, the pilots, me and myself, using a uh, uh, remote pilot license uh, to abide by Part 107 federal regulations. So I'm going to touch a little bit on all the logistics, and this is where we moved into the record survey report and map that Brian and his group put together. Uh, basically, Brian outlined all of the um, all of the items that we needed to present as part of this project. And I'll let Brian go ahead and, and discuss this a little bit further. Brian, good morning. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Nestor. Um, well, first off, I'm just going to uh, talk about the scre uh, sh screenshot you have up there now where it says the elevations have approximate vertical them of 0.05. Well, we met, we met that easily. We were actually within three inches or two and a half tenths in, in LIDAR data. And you probably ask, well, uh, how do I know that? Well, I'll explain that to you in a second. But all this data, all this text that you see on the screen, when Nestor shows you the GIS interactive map, 
this is a this is a outline of what's previous to that GIS map. So people want to know what the accuracies that are attained or what we followed or any of the parameters of how that GIS data was developed by survey means, this is a, your opening document. In order to go any further into the document, you have to accept it as if you were going on any other website and want to read their disclaimer of what their information is. So you know how that goes. Most people don't read it anyway. They click through it and go through. But if you really want to know what was achieved and what the outlines were of the, of the information, this is it. This is a survey. This is a surveyor's report, basically, that goes with the digital copy of the survey, which is the GIS map. Now, back to the accuracies is, is you know, all this sounds great, right? We have this fancy drone with this fancy LIDAR and all oh, this all should work out fine. Well, you know, a lot of people are skeptical about that. And, you know, so my job was more or less to give a confidence level to the data that we're getting it with the information that the LIDAR was providing, the drone was providing, and, and, and Nestor was gathering. Well, how we did that was, fortunately, we were, we're, we're partnered with the FDOT. They have a continuous operating station, core station for GPS here at, at the city that we were tied into, both Nestor and I were tied into. I was on the ground with the RTK GPS, and of course, Nestor's up in the air with the drone. Well, then we took that information and compared it to actually conventional benchmarks that we've had throughout the city. These conventional benchmarks are done just that by conventional means of survey level and rod, where years, years, and years, and years of, of setting points and maintaining this network. So we had a good ground network, ground control network, with the elevations done by conventional methods. So that being said, we have two good things going for us. We have a, we have a benchmark system throughout the city that's over 100 benchmarks that we could readily check into, as well as a uh, state-of-the-art GPS from the FDOT. This uh, core station. So what we did with that information we had is we got on the ground and we put down um, ground control points for Nestor to tie into when he's when he was flying. These ground control points were were basically done both ways with conventional and with and with the uh, RTK GPS. In the end, since the area we're getting such good accuracies, in the end we decided well with the tolerance we're trying to achieve. We're doing this, this is working out just fine with the RTK. So we use the RTK, but we sure didn't forget about checking into actual physical benchmarks as we were setting these points. So we set points along the flight paths for Nestor to check to, well, when, you know, with his point cloud. So in the end, you have, we had a ground XYZ and, and Nestor obtained an XYZ from the air. So we compared the two and it gave us our, our reports and our tolerances. And there was very few cases we did, we weren't perfect, but there was very few cases that we had to go back and adjust. So, you know, something wasn't quite right. But there was a lot of forethought given into this. And in talk of the data that we had as far as GPS and benchmarks, I've also had private data from private surveyors that did private work on private property for people that were here, you know, redoing their seawalls. And well, so we had plans for seawalls coming in the office, and the end result of those plans was required as an as built survey in NAVD 88. So we had somewhat of a database by even third party surveyors to compare what Nestor was getting with the LIDAR and what a third party was getting. So we even had a third check for all this. So that being said, you know, we, we, we had the as built, we had the RTK, we had the FDOT, we had benchmarks, and, you know, it all, it all, we all sewed it all together. And, you know, this is the end result, which you're going to see with Nestor's proof can show you. And it is something. I mean, it is really something, it, and, and that's Nestor did an excellent job and was very thorough. And with that, Dan, uh, Nestor, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Um, so there's everything that, uh, in a nutshell, what everyone needs to, uh, if anyone needs information on, on all the uh, little pieces and parts and accuracy, it's there and it's also on the uh, GIS site. But uh, let me go ahead and move forward. So again, the logistics of fire department, we coordinated to make sure we're flying under the, the existing COA. The, we met the FAA regulations with part 107. And then we moved into the data collection uh, process. And from start to finish, every one of these flights, this is basically all the steps that we needed to generate outputs. Uh, including identifying the mission areas, doing the flight planning, setting the ground control points, conducting the flights. Now the flights, you know, we said we had 55 miles of seawalls flown, but remember we had to fly one direction and had to fly back, so we basically flew over 100 miles with the drone. Um, we did the point clouds generation, and we have over 1.1 billion LIDAR points were processed. Uh, we would generate orthophotos, uh, DEMs, digital terrain models, contours, 3D models, 3D profiles, all these were as needed and we didn't do them for every every flight, but in cases where uh, engineering uh, or someone in public works needed any of those outputs, we would uh, be able to create them. And then we got into the elevations extraction where we had to individually, or I had to sit down and basically digitize uh, over 2,500 seawalls individually to extract the elevations. And I'm going to touch on those in a minute. So the first part, of, obviously, was identify the mission areas. This is just an example of uh, an, an, a finger of uh, one of the uh, uh, areas on the northwest uh, side of the island. And then we did the flight planning, where I had to sit down and, and plan every flight. You have to take into account, uh, obviously, the, the, um, the elevations, your distance, your batteries, your weather condition. Uh, file the five plans, uh, all those items you have to take into account. We would fly uh, in the mornings. Uh, we had enough battery packs to fly in the morning and then come back and start processing data in the afternoon. But also, um, as you can see here on this screenshot, uh, we'd make sure that all the flight plan uh, was visually uh, accurate, that the, that it was there was no obstacles, that the altitude, everything was so correct, uh, set correctly before uh, we went out. Uh, Brian and his crew would come in and, and uh, have the the GPS, uh, the ground control point set, uh, the elevations uh, prior to our flights, and then we conducted the started conducting the flights. And the screenshot just kind of shows you all the areas that were covered. Um, and again, some of the the corrections or the uh, verifications of the flight paths. Then after the flights, which was really the easy part, was the data collection pro processing of all that data. So as you can see in this screenshot, we would take and generate the point clouds. Um, and besides just generating the point clouds, we would again do the verification with the elevations, uh, with the ground control points. The image on the right shows you the advantage of the 410 sensor having the, the photos uh, taken as well at the same time, you can colorize the, the point clouds and, and, and see it that way. And you, we also had a uh, ground classify. So I would take the, um, all that data and ground classify it um, to grab the data uh, along the, not only the seawalls, but into the parcel. And then and there were cases, like I mentioned earlier, that they might have wanted ortho photos generated. We would generate ortho photos generate digital elevation models, generate digital terrain models, generate contours, and generate 3D models for those that needed uh, in engineering. They wanted to try their hand at bringing some of this stuff into CAD uh, in, in a model format. We generate our 3D profiles right from the LIDAR if we needed to examine some of those uh, seawalls closer. And then we got into the extraction. And with the help of uh, Lewis's group, 
um, they designed a tool for us that we could digitize uh, each seawall, the top of each seawall, and it would automatically extract the the minimum, the maximum, and the mean of those um, those those uh, areas that we were digitizing. Now, as you can see from this image, again, and as I had stated earlier, there's a lot of uh, a lot of vegetation on all these seawalls. I mean, it's very 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 dense in a lot of the areas. So even the LIDAR being that it could penetrate a lot of the vegetation, in, in some cases it just couldn't. And in some cases it gave us readings that were uh, not consistent. And, you know, in a perfect world, the seawalls would be all flat, there'd be no, no slopes and, and, and you're good to go. But there was a, a bunch of um, seawalls where we took all this data and sat down with engineering and came up with some formulas that we took back to GIS to have it run through the system and come back with seawalls that were out of um, a certain tolerance, whether it be in elevations between one and the other and slopes. Um, so once we flagged all those seawalls, I had to go back and examine, it came out to a little over 800 more uh, seawalls, had to go back and individually look at them again. Um, to make sure that the the data we captured was was correct, um, and again we re-examined those, looked at the profiles and everything, and, and and made sure that all the data that was collected met within the tolerances that uh, engineering had defined. So then we have all, now we have all that data, and the next step was to prioritize which seawalls needed to be reconstructed. Um, refurbished, uh, et cetera. But again, it wasn't just simply going by the lowest elevation of the seawall. We had to take a lot of factors into account. One was the elevation, but then we needed to take that into account the locations of the existing seawalls, the conditions, the contiguous, and then assign the rankings. So the first part was the elevations. So we had to come up with the accurate mean elevations, and which we did. Then we need to take into account king tides. Here in the city, we get king tides that are above 2.3 feet, basically a, over a foot higher than normal. And this is on a sunny day. You can get, we get street flooding you get, because you have seawalls that are way below 2.3 feet. So we, we need that to have to be taken into account that just raising um, the seawalls uh, wasn't gonna help you know, everything right away. Uh, you got to take into account king tides, you got to take into account uh, storm surges, you know, king tides in combinations with storms, all those uh, items had to be taken into account. So based on those evaluations of the just the elevations and the, and the king tide, the 2.3 feet, we identified uh, 66 city-owned seawalls that required raising. And as you can see in this photo here, this is just a uh, you know, a sunny day flooding from king tides. But one of the, the first, uh, besides the elevation analysis, we had to do locations. And we had to take into account the seawalls that are adjacent to roads that are used for emergency evacuations. So those roads and those seawalls are given a higher ranking than the ones that are just in residential neighborhoods or, or in, in, in streets, street ends. Uh, because obviously we need to make sure that those roads are always going to be clear uh, with storms moving forward. Mm -hmm. Then the next step was to take into account the condition of the existing seawalls, where you can see in a photo here, I mean, some are just, they needed to be repaired uh, right away just because of the condition, the de deterioration, whereas others could still, you know, hold their own for a few more years. So uh, we had already done back between 2011 and 2015, uh, and visual, visual inspections and, and on, on all the seawalls and, and catalog their conditions. So that was part of the assessment was the conditions of the existing seawalls. So we now we have elevation, location, and condition. Then we took the next part was take the contiguous seawalls. And basically it just means that we took the city seawalls that we know we needed to, to repair and we go up, went out at the, the adjacent to each seawall left and right, put all this in the GIS and had the system start going out in each direction until it hit an elevation of 5.7 feet or higher. 
So basically, what we didn't want to do is raise a seawall to 5.7, but on each side of, of it, you have private seawalls that are below, you know, two feet, and you're going to get all that flooding anyway. So we needed to start analyzing all the seawalls, all the all the adjacent seawalls uh, on each side to take into account if if we can approach these private uh, owners and say, hey, let's let's we're going to help you. You know, let's raise these, your seawalls to get everything within uh, within uh, the 5.7, so that all this you know neighborhoods don't don't flood. So that was just that was a, the the next factor was looking at all the adjacent seawalls uh, from the ones we plan to raise, and and that was the another part of the ranking. So then we moved into the ranking. We had again we had the city six, 66 city-owned seawalls that were identified needing reconstruction. And we said, let's divide them up into five groups with a two-year cycle for each group. So the whole program can be done over 10 years. And that was uh, taking all the uh, items that we I mentioned earlier, we identified the, the 66 seawalls and ranked them accordingly based on all the conditions on which ones needed to be done first and which ones could wait out to the 10 years. Then we moved into the mapping portion of it, where we basically had two parts to to uh, develop: was obviously the hard copy maps and then the interactive GIS. So the hard copy was simply this: we we uh, created a map showing all the um, the, the uh, prioritized uh, seawalls with their ranking locations, and that's uh, again can be adjusted at any time based on conditions changing on seawalls uh, moving forward. So now we had a, a base to, to work with. And then the next part was to take this all this information and create a, a site. Um, we have many sites within the city of Miami Beach. This is one of them that we um, I created to put all this data in so that staff can look at any time uh, for further planning and uh, functions and analyzing. So I'm going to jump over there real quick and show you a, a demo of it live. And this is the site when you first go in. And as Brian mentioned earlier, we have the, the basic disclaimer and the user can go in and look at the record survey and map that all the information that was provided uh, earlier that he pointed out. So once you go into the GIS, the users can now see we mapped all the elevations of each seawall. I mapped everything towards the parcels so that you could easily, quickly uh, look and see what, what's going on with the elevations throughout the city uh, without having to zoom in and just try and look at, at, the, at the parcels. Um, they're, they're broken down. You have the mean, you have the uh, max, and you have the uh, the minimums and the user can just simply click on any of them and pull up all the information, the addresses, the elevations, links, owner. Um, by using the property appraiser's data and our data, we uh, identified or tagged each parcel uh, with the, the type of seawall it was, the jurisdiction and the status of its existing under construction design, et cetera. Besides looking at all the seawall information, uh, we set up custom filtering, but the user can go in and filter by elevations. In this case, I'm showing that uh, we, we want to see everything that's 2.3 or below, then you can quickly just filter out and see see all those uh, individual seawalls. And I don't know how that turned on there. There we go. We have the jurisdictions as I mentioned before so you can see who owns what the user can go in and look at the uh, segments that that are the prioritized segments you can see here the costs for those segments the scores the rankings everything's there and then the the runs, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, where we used the system, GIS system to identify between the seawalls that needed to be 
uh, raised and how far out before it hit a 5.7 on each side. Um, we also have the the control points are all there with all the information, the the flights. Maybe there we go. The flight areas that were covered, and at the we also added the the dam information uh, gathered from from the lidar. Give me a second here to load up. So there you have it. So it it, it gives the users uh, and the staff quite a quite a good tool to go in and and look at areas um, throughout the city uh, as they need to when, when it relates to the seawalls. So I'm going to jump back over here. And oh, apologies. Jump back over here. OK. And Move forward. So I just went through the demo real quick. The, we did elevation analysis, the priorities, prioritization, the filtering, terrain models. And our ongoing projects include we're doing bridge inspections, features, extraction, impervious services, surfaces, and looking at getting into hyperspectral imaging here to look at our waterways uh, more closely with stuff that may be contaminating our waterways. And that brings us back over to Crystal. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us for our presentation. I appreciate it. And uh, Crystal, back to you. Thank you so much, Nestor and Brian. That is such a cool project and it's really awesome to see, you know, the start of its inception and then a final product. So it's very interesting and thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, before we start jumping into our Q&A portion, which Lewis, if you'll help facilitate a few of those questions that come through, I'm going to um, take over the presentation and launch one last poll question. So I'll share my screen really quick. So let me launch this one poll question real quick. And it's simply, what is your interest in the TrueView solutions? Um, you know, if TrueView doesn't fit your needs, we would love to have a conversation. Please feel free to email us at info at goq.com with further details, and we can go ahead and answer a few questions um, while we let this poll run. All right. Can you hear me okay, Crystal? I sure can. Yeah, so we've so a few questions have come in uh, during the presentations, which, um, by the way, Nestor and Brian was great. I really appreciate that. Um, one of the questions is uh, interesting on the uh, uh, from the point of view of drainage infrastructure. So you're raising seawalls. Uh, is there an effort that needs to come along to change the drainage? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that one, Nestor, if you don't mind. Okay, perfect. Yes. We we are the city is doing several things that are trying to you know help with the drainage woes that we have. We're I, I don't know exactly maybe Hester will remember, but we're installing these massive pump stations to pump this in water out. But you know we're raising the roads also, and so we're doing this. There's so many different facets of this this uh, global warming and and tidal you know tidal flooding and ponding is just unbelievable. So it's it's just this is definitely just the tip of one of the things that contributes to the flooding. And Nestor, didn't they say there that something like eighty these pump stations, something like that? Yes, that's a, a, a ballpark. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, new, new raising roads, new drainage, complete new drainage systems, uh, and and pump stations and and uh, um, generators, and all, all that is being done throughout the city. And that's that's one of the ongoing projects, Public Works, 
Uh, these are these are well. these are not no small pumps either. They're, they're huge. The pipes that are leading to and from those six feet in diameter. So thanks. There's uh, there's a question on how did you decide on the design? You know the new design height of seawalls. You know did you do some projective modeling and how far out do you think that takes you? Um, that that was done by engineering. I can't um, say off the top of my head. I did, it was done some. They did do modeling to project out to and, and I. And I may be wrong on this. I, I would say 2050, but I, I I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, but the 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 resiliency department, engineering, public works, they they all got together and 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 did put a modeling out to X number of years, and and we can we can provide that if that's uh, if you need it um, in order to come up with that 5.7. Because yes, obviously um, uh, you can go out further, uh, and you can it's, it's all a matter of money and time and we say we want to go out 100 years well you know where are we going to be um with how high we need to raise but um they did they did do modeling and so forth and that was done way way back prior to, obviously to this project being uh, commenced but we can we can get you if anyone needs that data we can obviously uh, put that together for you and, and let you know what we came up how we came up with that, that number it was okay. is actually is actually raised. It was a three two. Then another study came along and they said, well, three two is not good enough. It's going to be at five seven, and that's usually done on the engineering end. I think our city engineers, you know, in collaboration with other people, you know, came up with that number. Okay. There's a couple questions on when you were talking in the beginning, Nestor, about the trade off and cost analysis. So there was a couple questions just on, you know, what were the ratios when you looked at the different, um, the one difference or? Yes. Uh, well, just to give you an, an idea, the aerial LIDAR um, was, was we were quoted on, in the over $400,000 range um, for doing the citywide and, um, and, and they were all way above the, the, the boat LIDAR was, uh, Almost three hundred thousand, two hundred something thousand dollar range. Uh, in the in the end, the 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 lidar, our own you know, lidar drone, uh, ran us around a hundred thousand dollars. So the rest was just our time, uh, staff's time to do do the project. Um, so it that was kind of like the, the big a big difference there. Yeah, another question on. You know, do, did you have any pushback or interaction with property owners that were worried about drones flying over their property, or, or even uh, more so than that? The you know you were out well, figuring out ways that they needed to spend money. <laughs> well, let me let me say this before we even as I've said this before, and before we even thought of putting a drone up in the air. Of course, we have we have a legal staff here at the, the city. And we had an opinion provided on the deployment of drones and you know based on the Florida statutes and he gave us you know our legal department gave us the authorization so to speak with their interpretation of the law and it basically as long as we followed the FAA rules you know uh, it, the drone the drone could be deployed under the the provision for mapping and by professional surveyors so that's where that's where it was deployed under a provision of the, you know when drones first came out there was a house bill that got presented and it ended up getting passed that the you know, for surveying purposes drones can be deployed and in government agencies also so there, this was well thought before we even because we have a lot of particular people here at the city and yes that was a very big concern before we even put the bird up in the air yes and and and, and the touch on that uh, thank you brian was that um keep in mind all, all our flights were done over water 
technically we we were we didn't fly over the uh, over any uh, seawalls directly we the, all the flights were done over water um, um, to collect the data of the seawalls and the and the uh, property and and at, at no point did the drone hover over anybody's property uh, or near anybody's property um, they, they just flew the flight pass and, and over the water and and back so we we avoided flying uh, over anybody's property just in case uh, so that you know just just to add that added um, security I think you may have mentioned this, but is the is the city requiring private property owners their seawalls to the minimum level? Not not at this time. Well, let me back up. It, it's being required when they do a new construction or uh, a refurbishment. Yes, then they're required to be at the 5.7. But um, existing owners, other than that, are not required to um, to raise to 5.7, but because of this um, project and because we were able to gather the data for all the all the seawalls, now now staff and and administration can approach private citizens and with with the data and and see uh, options that that might be beneficial to them and their neighborhoods to raise to have them raise their their seawalls and look at options and how the city can assist in doing that. So that was. One of the reasons we needed to collect the data for all the seawalls, not just the city seawalls, we wanted to be able to have accurate data that we can go back to the private um, owners and and show them what's going on with them and their neighbors. So what's next? So you've done this massive seawall project. What do you have on your plate to do next? Well. Um, Again, we 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 looking at uh, other options for using the, the the drone now, putting it more more used for for uh, construction planning and engineering and design. So so uh, we have flown some some neighborhoods with it, and hopefully you know, we'll be able to fly some more um, and use it uh, be, use it for more mainstream uh, analysis uh, when it comes to. To designing and, and engineering again as Brian mentioned we're we're raising roads throughout the city and uh, the the unit is is very valuable in collecting uh, the, the data existing data there and modeling it to to see what's involved in, in planning and uh, construction moving forward so um, that's that's probably the number one priority with that but there's other uses as I mentioned with the uh, Hyperspectral imaging that that we've talked about, maybe using for looking, analyzing our waterways, and then who knows what else is out there. We we we've got enough to keep us busy between that, the 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 flooding, the uh, uh, the beaches with our erosions and, and storms and stuff like that. So we got plenty on our plate to uh, to keep us busy using uh, using the drones for uh, for gathering data. Nestor, could you mention too what what kind of what kind of uh, an, you know angular? You don't have to be right over the the, the feature, correct? No, that and um, the, the reason yes, we 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 flew basically uh, just a, a rough estimate. Uh, what was it, about 150 feet altitude, or 50 feet uh, off the seawall uh, over the water, so that we could capture. The, not only the top of the seawall and into the par property, but uh, the face of the seawall as well. So, um, so that's the the reasoning on why we we flew over the water, uh, just so that we could gather more data, uh, and and also you know help with the penetration of the the vegetation uh, onto the surface of the seawall because that's again the biggest pro problem we have here is there's just a ton of vegetation covering these seawalls, and uh, uh, you know it would have been nice to just be able to do it. All in, in one pass and and uh, digitize it once and come back with, with clean data, but no, that you know because of the vegetation, we, we had to go back and, and look at look at it again closer. Uh, but you know, it's just part of the part of the process. Uh, someone that or areas that may not that don't have any vegetation to worry about, then then you're, you're golden. You're, you know, you're going to get the data nice and clean and, and right the first time. But 
when it comes to vegetation with in, and even with the penetration you still uh, need to double the double check your your analysis your data are you, are you currently doing any uh bathymetric work and have you considered using bathymetric um, I'm not the GIS division is not Brian are you doing anything bathymetric wise? No, not really. I mean, we, you know, that's still, I know that they have the little, the little sounding units that they go on the boat, but no, we really haven't gotten to, into that yet. But we, we may be because, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at some of our suboculous utility crossings right now. So, you know, that might be in the future. We had a question on, you know, what was the timeline? Did you ever compute just, you know, I know we had a lot of interruptions in the COVID and, you know, and other reasons. Um, on, 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 yes. Um, thank you, Louis. Yes. All, all in all, we, the whole project got completed within, I would say within, if you were to put all the time, the flying and the processing, and everything, Within a six-month time period, um, even though that wasn't the case in actual time, only because um, we 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 started in early 20, um, and then uh, I had a, a an accident and, and put me out of commission for eight months. So um, we didn't pick it back up to early uh, 21. So, um, but basically, if you take the contiguous time, it um, it, it was a around six months we were able to do it from start to finish um the, the the planning the flying the processing the the mapping you know the prioritization all that um we around around a six month time frame we, we were hoping to do it within four initially but it, 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 you know there's other factors and it just came out to be around six months still seems pretty remarkable to me it's a large project clients yeah. using our systems and yours is definitely on the very large side so anyway congratulations for that a terrific project and i really very much appreciate uh both of you nestor and brian doing this presentation for us and covered all the questions and yes we will make the presentation available and crystal yes before we comments? go yeah, before we go, uh, we did want to announce our next webinar, which will be held Monday, November 15th. Um, here at GOQ, we've been working on a number of exciting projects. And in this webinar, we will introduce some recent developments, including software workflow developments and our point cloud processing software, new product offerings and hardware updates. So uh, we will be hosting this webinar at two different times. So be on a lookout for a link to that uh, webinar. Uh, so that you can keep up to date with everything we got going on here at GOQ. I want to, again, of course, thank Lewis, Nestor, Brian for joining us today and everyone who's attended. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to everyone registered. Um, and we will hope to hear from you soon. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Crystal, Lewis, Brian, everyone.